Well, now the grain and soybean markets have been kind of during this last year. Uh, as you are well aware, we had a slew of USDA reports come out on Tuesday a couple of days ago, January 12th. And usually that January report is pretty routine. It kind of picks up, you know, from where the November report left off. It's the final summary for the year, but not this year. Uh, as you're well aware, uh, if you follow the grain markets at all, we've had quite an unusual year in 2009. Uh, it was wet and cool in the spring, which delayed planting. And then we had a very cool summer, which slowed the development of crops. And it caused all kinds of concerns and fears about the early frost uh, prospects. Uh, then we had the cool, wet fall, a delayed harvest, a lot of ramifications in all those uh, those developments, the way the season unfolded for uh, the production numbers, the yields, uh, stocks numbers, carryover, about everything. And we could spend hours on all these fundamentals and data uh, that you could have found in the reports that you see listed there, the numbers that we got updated on Tuesday. But we are going to focus on only a couple of the reports that provided the biggest shocks. And uh, as you are probably well aware, if you follow the grain markets at all, we did have a couple of pretty significant shocks because uh, of the surprise in one case, way to the upside, side, or at least that would be the presumption of what we're thinking based on what we had expected going into the report. Uh, the two reports we're going to look at are the winter wheat seedings, and then the final, and I put final in quotes there, production numbers uh, and yields for corn and soybeans because they really aren't final, as we'll talk about in a little bit. We also got the quarterly stocks report, which indicates kind of where the feed demand and the, the uh, other demand for ethanol and so forth is going in the first quarter of the year. Uh, we have new supply demand estimates, uh, so that gives us a season-ending carryover figure. And then we also got a lot of numbers on what the world crop outlook is. And there were some things in that report that were also kind of interesting for uh, the longer term uh, outlook. Uh, when we look at then at some of the uh, first of those reports, it would be the winter wheat report. The winter wheat seedings had kind of a big surprise in a lot of ways simply because when you look at the surprise that uh, we had, it was just so different from what we have had in the past. Last year, 2009 acres, we had, according to USDA, 43, 43 million, a little over 43 million acres. Uh, the pre-report estimates that we got from all the experts, they said, well, we're going to have about 41 million. Uh, you know, coming up this year because they anticipated the acreage would be down because of the delays and harvest or, and, and the uh, crops that had to get out of the way first before some of the wheat could be sown. But USDA came out with their numbers on Tuesday and the shock in the, in the report and the numbers was they came up with only 37 million, a little over 37 million acres. Now, when you look at that number, it's not very large, but it's way lower than a year ago. It's the lowest acreage total that we've had for winter wheat since, uh, I think it's 1913, I read, century, that we have had that few winter wheat acreage. Uh, you'll see also where you'll have the breakdown there of the hard red winter. Uh, hard red winter wheat is a wheat that is traded in Kansas City. And then you also have the uh, uh, hard or uh, soft red, rather, that is traded in Chicago, which is a contract that a lot of people follow simply because it ties in with the, the other grains and you know, compare that. Now, all of that would have seemed to have been quite a shocker when you look at the bare numbers for wheat and you would expect that that would cause everybody to be very bullish. As it turned out, so in terms of being bullish, was muted because when you have intermarket analysis at play and one market affecting the other, uh, you know, there are things that can happen in other markets that are a direct influence on what happens in the market that you're looking at. And in this case, there was a direct influence on what happened in wheat. The other, the real shock of the report, considering uh, at least in terms of the price movement, and that is that when USDA was tallying up the numbers, they came up with a quite a surprise in the corn estimate. And as I pointed out before, when we had the wet season that delayed everything and we had a lot of delays in what was going on in the 
uh, harvesting and so forth, and there was still uh, a lot of corn that was out, you know. But when you look at what we had a year ago, let's that, let's take that away and make that a translucent figure there. If we can do that, so we can show you a little bit, highlight a few of these uh, areas here. We had a little over 12 billion bushels of corn in 2008. The people that were, you know, should be in the know were uh, estimating it. Well, first of all, let's point out USDA had 12.92. A billion bushels in the December estimate, and the analysts in the pre-report estimates came up with a number that the average trade guess or average analyst guess 13 point or 12.82 billion bushels. So everybody was kind of expecting that the crop size from the previous reports would go down, uh, you know, at least some because of the effect of the corn that was still out in the field. But the shock of the routine billion bushel corn crop. And now we have had a 13 billion bushel crop in the past, but this is the largest and perhaps the most surprising of the report simply because it was so unexpected. Now, one of the things you have to remember about this report is that at the time that the surveys were taken, uh, still there's 5% of the corn that was in the field at the time of the survey. That out, the final number, as we have it in quotes there is not really a final number because USDA has announced that it will resurvey farmers that had corn in the fields to see what the actual results were rather than what they expected results to be in that regard. But I suspect that after a uh, season, that when getting to the end of the season, they'll probably recalculate and feed you of things in the end what the final figure for 2009 will be. What they have done so far is they have factored in the corn that was in the field at the average yield that they set for the other crop that's already been harvested. They've calculated the field corn, the corn is still in the field, into the uh, on-farm stocks number. So there are a lot of things that are influenced by what the actual numbers are going to be. So in the long run, you know, the analysts could still very well be correct, very well be correct and that the corn crop that the USDA uh, came up with in this January would be correct than they are. Um, now the numbers that we see here on corn are quite bearish. Uh, they pulled a lot of prices down, but those are the numbers that the market has to work with. When you look at what the uh, the other reports, the reports affecting soybeans, when you see the soybean numbers, we had soybean numbers that came in about as expected. So from a price standpoint, uh, not as many ramifications of what would happen you know, with the uh, delayed harvest and so forth and how that would affect total production size or yield. And it's not such a surprise you know, that, that uh, soybeans kind of were influenced by some of the other crops. We're going to talk about the soybean chart in a little bit. When we look at the markets and try to figure out, you know, we, as I say, we can talk about these numbers all day. We don't want to get into a big fundamental uh, discussion of all the fundamentals and the reports because there are dozens of numbers and if you wanted me to I have them laying right here and we could go down line by ultimately when we talk about that we're talking about some estimates uh, I've seen reports from a firm that has satellites in the air a private firm that disputes what USDA has come up with numbers but because USDA bases theirs more on farmer reports and uh, you know maybe their methods aren't as up to date we'll find out you know that's to be known yet but what can't do a lot about that anyway. We know what the numbers are that USDA has reported, and we have to live with it. That's the way the market works. So rather than spend all day trying to analyze reports and trying to guess what the actual numbers are or what they're going to be, we're going to leave all that to the fundamentalists, and we're going to focus more on the price situation and trading. Uh, I'm going to use for that analysis Vantage Point Intermarket Analysis Software. I need to make it clear, first of all, that I am not a salesman. I'm not selling a product and uh, I'm not receiving money for products sold and not trying to push anything you know, in the way of a software program. I'm trading strategies and using them you know, for things that I want to do to trade myself and, and benefit.